All right, hello everyone, and welcome to the topology session. We have four exciting presentations lined up for you to enjoy. Before we begin, just a quick reminder that you can ask your questions both in the YouTube chat and on Discord. Uh, we have four presentations nicely mixing between scalar fields and vector fields. And our first presentation is on vector field data. The work comes from the University of Heidelberg, from Lutz Hoffmann and Philipp Sarno. And we are going to learn about a particular feature from unsteady vector fields called distinguished hyperbolic trajectories. Hello, everyone. This is Lutz Hoffmann from the Visual Computing Group at Heidelberg University in Germany. And I'm going to talk about our work on the extraction of distinguished hyperbolic trajectories for 2D time-dependent vector field topology. A 2D steady vector field assigns a velocity to each point in a two-dimensional domain. Its topology is defined by saddle-type critical points, which are locations of vanishing velocity, where the Jacobian has positive and negative real eigenvalues. The streamlines that converge to such a saddle-type critical points in either forward or backward time are called separatrices because they separate the two-dimensional domain into regions of similar flow behavior. The separation of streamlines can also be measured using the finite time Lyapunov exponent. And in the steady case, the ridges in the forward and backward FTLE fields intersect at saddle points and are consistent with separate receives. In time-dependent vector fields, the FTLE measures the separation of path lines. In this case, ridges in the FTLE fields correspond to Lagrangian co coherent structures, which act as the main organizing structures of the flow. LCS in the forward and backward FTLE fields intersect in a special kind of path lines, which are called hyperbolic trajectories. LCS can also be obtained by seeding generalized streak lines along the hyperbolic trajectories. In this sense, the hyperbolic trajectories take on the role of saddle-type critical points from steady vector field topology, and LCS take on the role of separatrices. These together are also called streak-based topology. Having these notions based on the FTLE makes it difficult to extract directly. Because the computation of the FTLE is expensive, the extraction of ridges is numerically challenging, and FTLE ridges also intersect in false positives. In previous work, Sadlo and Weisskopf extracted hyperbolic trajectories by pathline integration that is started on FTLE ridge intersections. This has the problems that FTLE ridges also intersect in false positives and that the numerical integration is made unstable by the attracting and repelling manifolds that are involved. In order to avoid numerical pathline integration, Machado and colleagues obtained hyperbolic trajectories as space-time bifurcation lines. For this, they first locally extracted candidate lines by solving a parallel vectors problem in space-time. These candidate lines are then locally deformed toward the nearest space-time streamline. This approach has the issues that the refinement scheme is numerically unstable and it might result in an arbitrary nearby path line which does not need to be a hyperbolic trajectory. One problem of the previous approach is that it lacks the proper definition of a hyperbolic trajectory based on the dynamics of the flow. One such definition is given by Ida and colleagues, who consider the localized flow defined by the Jacobian along a path line. The solution of the localized flow is the fundamental solution matrix that has the finite time Lyapunov exponents as singular values. Based on those, a hyperbolic trajectory is one that has one positive and one negative Lyapunov exponent. Those hyperbolic trajectories that generate the time-dependent topology of a flow are called distinguished hyperbolic trajectories and are defined by two additional conditions. First, all nearby trajectories must leave a bounded region around it in either forward or backward time, 
And second, it must not be an intersection of attracting or repelling manifolds of other hyperbolic trajectories. We will later see that the last point manifests itself as false positive FTLE rich intersections. The path line in the previous discussion can be replaced by an arbitrary path that is near a hyperbolic trajectory. Based on the fundamental solution of the localized flow along this arbitrary path, one can construct a coordinate transformation that transforms the localized flow into a steady and linear flow. The matrix defining the linear flow is diagonal and its diagonal entries are given by the finite time Lyapunov exponents. This means that in this coordinate frame the attracting and repelling directions are now decoupled. This allows us to integrate in backward time along the repelling direction and in forward time along the attracting direction. By doing so, for each point of the initial path, we obtain a refinement toward a hyperbolic trajectory. In the visualization context, the localized flow has been used by Kasten and colleagues to compute a localized variant of the FTLE. Weinkauf and Teisel used it to derive a vector field such that streak lines are tangent curves of it. Recently, Hoche and Günther proposed a new approach to unsteady vector field topology that is based on an optimal steady reference frame that they obtained by local linear optimization. Our method for computing the 2D time-dependent vector field topology consists of three steps. First, we locally extract candidate lines by using an extension of the method by Rojo and Günther. Second, we refine these toward hyperbolic trajectories using an extension of the method by Ida and colleagues. And finally, we seed streak manifolds along those hyperbolic trajectories by an extension of the method by Machado and colleagues. In their original work, Rojo and Günther propose to decompose the time-dependent flow into a steady reference frame and observer motion based on linear optimization, such that critical points in the steady frame are aligned with hyperbolic trajectories and move along the observer motion. We found that these properties of their proposed optimal reference frame do not hold for general time-dependent flows, as can be seen in this example here and is further shown in our paper. However, these features provide good initial candidates for refinement toward hyperbolic trajectories. We further take up on this idea that features move along observer motion and extract robust parts of candidates in the steady reference frame and extend them by integrating along the observer motion. Reference frames that have been used in previous work are the left frame and the Galilean fr invariant frame based on the feature flow field. Using the lab frame to obtain initial candidates has the disadvantage that it does not yield any features in regions where the flow is dominated by an ambient flow. This can be overcome by using the Galilean invariant frame defined by the feature flow field or by using the optimal steady frame as proposed by Rojo and Günther. We found that in all our experiments, using the optimal frame as proposed by Rojo and Günther yielded the best results. Having obtained the hyperbolic trajectories, we see its streak manifolds at an offset along them. Previous work used the directions of the real eigenvectors of the instantaneous Jacobian of the flow for this offset, which however is not well aligned with the LCS in general. From the coordinate transformation that was involved in the refinement toward the hyperbolic trajectories, we obtain directions which are approximately tangential to the LCS, so we use these for our offsets. We compute stream surfaces in the space-time domain and obtain streak lines as time slices of these surfaces. This means that we have computed the time-dependent topology over the entire time interval in one step, which corresponds to extraction of LCS from a densely computed FTLE. Our computation is typically two orders of magnitude faster than the direct approach and there is no rich extraction involved. Our approach also does not suffer from false-positive FTLE-rich intersections. 
The main difference to steady vector field topology, which is defined by streamlines, is that several trees in unsteady vector field topology can intersect. In this case, the streak manifolds of either two different or of the same hyperbolic trajectory intersect along a path line. Such a path line manifests itself as a false positive FDE ridge intersection. However, it is not a generator of the unsteady flow topology, so it is not a distinguished hyperbolic trajectory. As an example, we apply our approach to a numerical simulation of a flow behind the cylinder. We use paths of critical points in the steady reference frame proposed by Rojo and Günther to obtain initial candidates. The refinement scheme employed by Machado and colleagues is able to partially correct the initial candidates toward the nearest FTD ridge intersection, but is unstable behind the cylinder and in some cases it converges to the wrong path line. Our refinement toward hyperbolic trajectories, on the other hand, yields better results. Computing the streak topology from these hyperbolic trajectories, we obtain streak lines that are well aligned with the ridges in the forward and backward FTLE fields. Applying the approach also proposed by Rojo and Günther, who extract steady vector field topology in their steady reference frame, we see that these separatrices are not well aligned with ridges in the FTLE fields, and also these separatrices cannot intersect. To conclude my talk, we have presented an approach to 2D time-dependent vector field topology, which is consistent with FDLE ridges. Its extraction is efficient because it does not rely on the flow map. It is based on refinement of initial candidate lines, which is an extension of the approach of Ida and colleagues. This refinement is more reliable than that of Machado and colleagues, and the resulting topology is more accurate than that proposed by Rojo and Günther. We have also discussed an unsteady equivalent of settled connectors, which correspond to false positive FDLE ridge intersections. The extension to 3D is left as future work, because the straightforward extension of hyperbolic trajectories to 3D does not suffice, as has been shown by Uffinger and colleagues. Thank you for your attention. You may find the source code for our refinement on GitHub. All right, so we have time for questions. So, uh, the audience, please go ahead and phrase your questions in the YouTube chat or in the Discord. Um, so, maybe while we're waiting for things to get started here, um, Lutz, you have a very nice uh, approach here that combines the local and the global methods, the local ones which have their assumptions, the global ones which usually uh, require all the time steps in order to, to compute. And you've done it in a way that in the end allows it to be very efficient in computing these structures. Um, could you give us maybe a bit more detail about the computation time? So how long does it take to compute the results? How many iterations do you need in order to refine to the lines? Uh, so the major part is spent in finding these initial candidates, which uh, if you use uh, your optimal ref reference frame, it it takes several minutes um, together with the tracking of the critical points and extension along the observer motion. And uh, the refinement is ne negligible in this case. It's in the order of several milliseconds. Um, so as you said, there's an iteration involved in this refinement. There's actually two. So I didn't have time to go into detail in the video, but there's two kinds of iterations involved. First, we take this initial uh, localized uh, flow along the candidate line, then we uh, we integrate forward and backward directions, and because we do this at the same time, we get an implicit equation which has to iterate it using a fixed point iteration, and uh, usually the, the outer loop where we take this uh, localized uh, flow converges in like two or three iterations, and uh, we need about 100 fixed point iterations in between, so yeah, it 
it's uh, th that part is pretty fast. Very good, very good. So I think a nice thing to add is that you have source code online, right? Yes. All right. Um, maybe another um, thing you discussed in the paper uh, is the stability under perturbations of your initial candidate. Um, would you like to share some thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, so we in the paper we looked in detail at how the refinement behaves if the initial candidate is uh, perturbed. So if it's not, um, if it's uh, at some points maybe it's closer to the ground truth, and at other points it diverges more, more seriously, because we use this approach where we, in some parts we have tracked critical points which are usually quite good and in other parts the extent along this observer motion which is just an approximation and can diverge quite far and uh, so, so we have found that this refinement is usually able to uh, to to get rid of these errors um, so when it diverges uh, can you detect when that happens so can you sort out these these problems um, well, usually if it diverges, it just leaves the domain. So that's what yeah. one. So because uh, these uh, numerical data sets are always uh, have a bounded domain, this is, that's also a challenge for the algorithm when there, for example, are obstacles in the flow. So mm -hmm. it can uh, get stuck in obstacles. That's why in these in flows where there's many obstacles, we also extracted uh, space time separation and, and attraction lines. All right. Do we have any questions from the audience? If you don't have questions right now, you can still always ask your questions later in the Discord, um, where it's easy to uh, connect directly with Lutz, to, and he will certainly be around to answer all your questions. All right, then let's thank Lutz again for his presentation, and we can move on to our next talk. Next work is from the University of Leipzig, Freiberg, Hannover, and the German Climate Computing Center in Hamburg. And the authors are Christian Blecher, Felix Reit, Arne Jonas Preger, Thomas Nagel, Olaf Kollitz, Jobst Maßmann, Niklas Röber, Michael Böttinger, and Gerig Scheuermann. And we are going to learn about fiber surfaces for many variables. As we all know, simulations are getting more and more complex nowadays. And if we're looking on disciplines like climate research, fluid dynamics, geology or structural mechanics, we all agree that they need to interpret multivariate data. But up to now, it's only possible to investigate one to three variables and their relations at the same time, using isosurfaces, fiber surfaces by Carr et al. or the fiber surfaces by Wright et al. We remove the restrictions by the introduction of d-dimensional fiber surfaces, which give us the possibility to analyze any finite number of variables at the same time. In the end, we will demonstrate our algorithm um, by applying it to two datasets from geology and climate research. But let's start with a short explanation about fiber surfaces. Isosurfaces are the pre-image of an isovalue of a one-dimensional codomain into a domain, like the 3D a physical space. So an isovalue forms a point in a one-dimensional codomain and a line in a two-dimensional codomain. But what's now the pre-image of a two-dimensional isovalue? It's the intersection of the isosurface of both one-dimensional components, which is called a fiber, and which we can see as a bold line in these pictures. If we assume a steady codomain, a line segment in our codomain would form multiple fibers, and if we connect these fibers, we get a surface in our domain. So the pre-image of a line segment is called a fiber surface. This technique was introduced by Carr et al. And it was even extended to a three-dimensional codomain by Wright et al. Their algorithm uses a tetrahedral grid as base and three scalar fields, which are calculated uh, using a second-order tensor field and calculating 
the three invariants of it. These three scalar fields, which are defined on the saturate grid, are used as new coordinates for every vertex of the saturate grid. So if we transfer the saturate grid into the space of these three invariants of the second order tensor, uh, we are not losing the uh, connections between the uh, vertices. So now we have our tetrahedral grid inside our invariant space. So as engineers are interested in the selection of region of interest, right at all gave them the opportunity to do this using interactors, which are only convex solids or the red cube in the middle picture. But right at all are only interested in the triangulated surface, because the fiber surface they extract is the intersection of this triangulated surface with the grid. So they clip every triangle against each tetrahedron, which is only a simple intersection, and the result is mapped back into the physical domain, which then forms our fiber surface, which we can see on the left side. Blecher et al. figured out that this extraction algorithm does not depend on the free invariance of a second order tensor. It can use every combination of free variables. So the next step would be the extension to a d-dimensional codomain. Our algorithm also assumes a tetrahedral grid and now these scalar fields which are defined on this tetrahedral grid. But our region of interest is a d minus one dimensional hypersurface, which will then be intersected with the grid. This hypersurface must be convex and is formed using hyperplanes, which we are defined using a distance and an outwards pointing normal. The fiber surface extraction at all is done by the algorithm by the intersection of all tetrahedra with the hyperplanes one by one, which breaks down the complexity uh, into multiple intersections of a hyperplane with a tetrahedron. We did it this way around because we assume that the number of hyperplanes is much smaller than the number of tetrahedra. Furthermore, we expect the number of tetrahedra to decrease over the time because um, all tets which lie inside the hyperplane or the par if it will be intersected, the inside part of the tet will be added to a new list which then will be processed by the next hyperplane and all tets which lie on the outside of the hyperplane will be skipped. So after each hyperplane was processed we get a list with triangles which are the faces of the intersected tetrahedra of the intersection of the tetrahedron with our hyperplane and a list of tets which we then project back into our domain which forms our resulting fiber surface and an additional tetrahedral grid which was cut out of the original and now lies completely in our hypersurface. So after the general idea should be clear, I want to focus on some details, for example the intersection of the hyperplane with the TET. For each hyperplane we do a pre-processing step, where each vertex of the grid will be inserted in the hazard normal form of the current hyperplane to determine its relative position compared to the hyperplane. For each tetrahedron we calculate the number of in and outside points and to look if it will be intersected by the hyperplane or not. If it has vertices on both sides, it will be intersected. So this means that the d minus one dimensional hyperplane intersects the three dimensional subspace of the TET as a plane, which gives us two different scenarios where we have a triangular or a quadrilateral cut. But both cuts are part of the fiber surface definition of our current hyperplane. The intersection of the TET yields to three uh, different cases. In the first case, uh, the remaining part is already tetrahedron, so we are finished. Or we get, uh, like this one, a prism type polyhedron or another prism type of polyhedron. After that, we have to triangulate the quadrilateral faces to form new tetrahedra, because every step of our algorithm um, uses only tetrahedra. To preserve the grid integrity, we have to be sure that adjacent tetrahedra, which share the same face, triangulate these faces in the same way. As high dimensional spaces are hard to visualize and hard to interpret, as we are talking for a d 
DE, which is greater or equal to 4, we use multiple views which show three dimensional subspaces of our d dimensional codomain. So we project our grid into each subspace and then we could select a region of interest uh, with interactors in each of these views. After that, we combine multiple interactors to form our d dimensional, d minus 1 dimensional hypersurface. Let's look on some results. The first data set we are used was produced by the Federal Institute of Geosciences and Human Resources in Hanover, Germany. They simulated processes in and around a general non-site specific model of nuclear waste repository, which we can see here in, as a red stripe in the left picture. The idea was to check if the influence of the nuclear decay is high enough to change the temperature and the pressure so that fissures and cracks would form which could reach the covering of the repository. This would be bad, as um, radionuclides now could be released into the biosphere. We used this data set because we wanted to show that we could produce the same fiber surface as pleasure at all before, and we could analyze this data set even with more variables. So we have our, uh, in the first step, our three-dimensional codomain, uh, which is uh, built of a temperature, the fluid pressure, and the equivalent effective stress. This is a quite nice codomain because um, we can see that the bulge forms over the time. And now we see the results by Blecher at all using the fiber surfaces of Wright at all, and they extracted some fiber surfaces which enclosed the chambers of the repository, which you can see in the right part of the picture. We use the same interactor, the same data set, and what we can see in the right side of the picture, we produce the same fiber surface, up to some numerical errors and a different lighting model. In the second step, we extended the codomain by the eigenvalues of the stress tensor, which are also called principal stresses, to our six-dimensional codomain. The second interactor in the second view, which you can see in the middle of the picture, restrained restrains our region of interest even more, which will be emphasized by the higher temperature inside our repository on the right side. The second example uses data from a regional weather simulation above Germany for the April 26 in 2013. This data set was made available by the DKRZ as part of the IEEE Cyrus Contest in 2017. The shown visualization was produced by them using the framework Parareal. The red box in this visualization shows a subset of the whole dataset we are, uh, want to analyze, and it shows a part of a current storm. In the first case, we use a three-dimensional codomain, which is built of the wind velocities u, v, and w, and we've restricted it to a high updraft and high velocity and extracted these nice chimneys in our physical domain in the middle, in B. In the second case, we extended our codomain to a six-dimensional codomain using cloud ice, cloud water, and rainwater concentrations. And we cut it uh, with respect to high cloud ice and high cloud water concentrations. Both restrictions in 6D uh, lead us to a region with high updraft moisture transport, which are called the power supply of a storm, which you can see in C. So, in the end, we extended the fiber surface of right at all from 3 to D dimensions in the codomain, um, and we clip each that we drawn um, with each hyperplane. So, the hyperplane intersects the 3 dimension subspace of the TET only as a plane, which reduces the complexity of the whole algorithm to a simple plane TET intersection in three dimensions. We applied our algorithm to two different datasets and showed that multiple concurrent constraints are nice to um, select some regions of high load in the surrounding of a non-site specific general model of nuclear waste repository and to select some power supplies of a storm over Germany. Future work could be the optimization um, of the whole algorithm to allow the interactive exploration of large data sets or the improvement of the visualization techniques for codomain and for the subspaces. Thank you for your attention and I'm ready for your questions.
Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, so Carsten Drink is asking, is it reasonable for a domain expert to work with the framework to select regions of interest in the daily work? It depends on the data he is working on. So, um, for example, if you're looking on our uh, on the data set from the work, on the previous work uh, for the Pacific Risk paper, uh, where we analyzed uh, general non site specific nuclear waste repository um, with many variables, uh, it's, it could be possible because we have so many scalar uh, variables we want to analyze and we have to look uh, at the same time because, the for example, the temperature influences the uh, fluid pressure, which which influences the stability of the rock, and so, and all, also uh, other uh, phenomena and physical processes like the like biomechanics or chemical processes uh, could be um, influenced by this increase in temperature. So, yeah, there is a good idea to look on many variables and. Uh, if you want to select regions of interest with uh, many constraints for different variables, then you should, uh, or you could use now our d-dimensional fiber surface. Um, do we have any? Oh, Maybe sorry. another uh, another thing is what I could imagine is if you want to reduce your whole data set um, due to multiple constraints in all variables, you could use our algorithm because uh, the other product of our algorithm is not only the uh, fiber surface, it's also the part of the whole tetrahedral grid which lies inside our hypersurface. So, or in the domain which lies inside all fiber surface, which is enclosed by them. Mm -hmm. So you could use them to filter your data and uh, use this filtered data um, later in some other visualization techniques or processing steps. Sounds good. Um, Michael Böttinger is asking a question. Could the extension to multiple variables be made publicly available via, for instance, TTK? Um, the, it could be, but it would be um, much work because uh, we have to implement uh, the whole algorithm and the underlying data set uh, structure to TTK because we implemented it in our own uh, framework we are using, uh, which is called uh, Phantom uh, at the University of Leipzig. And so it is possible, but I think as everything in research, you have to have much time and resources to bring it to open access and to uh, polish some things. Very true. Well, the, the community behind TTK is growing very quickly, so maybe there's also people that could lend you a hand in, in doing this. Um, all right. Um, now, you mentioned in, in one of your last slides um, that you would like to investigate possible improvements um, for the visualization techniques. Um, do you have some ideas that you might want to share, for instance, in assisting the user in finding uh, scalar combinations that actually do occur in the domain? So um, for ideas uh, about the visualization of our co-domain, uh, there are some ideas. Um, uh, we discussed them in our first work, in the work by Wright et al. Um, so we discussed some techniques like the wireframe uh, visualization, which we are using every time our uh, normal diffusion density based uh, volume rendering or like some uh, shading of the faces of the tetrahedra but uh, it's not so easy to visualize this codomain because we have so many self-intersecting tetrahedra and the thing is for us the wireframe works uh, quite nice because first we have so many tetrahedra so uh, sometimes it seems we have um, uh, solid or uh, surface like that and the other thing is we have we can see sharp edges or sometimes uh, outlying points which could be a hint for um, errors inside the simulation 
And the other, uh, the other part of the question is, uh, we help the user to select non-empty, none of such non-empty, uh, none of but none of such empty uh, combinations of constraints because uh, he could extract in our first three-dimensional subspace uh, its region of interest, and then he maps the whole region into the new three-dimensional subspace, and then he can see where first where it lies inside the whole tetrahedral grid of this uh, project subspace, and also where the um, until now filtered uh, part of the grid lies. And so he can put his interactor or uh, his triangulated surface in the end uh, inside this region or cut out a part of this region. And uh, so it's fulfilled that he don't uh, have in the end zero tetrahedra or zero fiber surface triangles. Yeah. Um, I see a question from Hamish Khan. He asks, do you have thoughts on interface choices? That is, how do we specify an arbitrary boundary in ND? Um, there are two um, things. First, we uh, you could define um, a hyperplane in D dimensions uh, if you only specify the d dimensional normal and the distance from the origin as our as all hyperplanes are um, defined like this like with the normal and our distance because we are using the has a normal form to uh, in our calculations and the other thing is um, if we are dealing or if we are using multiple of our three dimensional subspaces we could insert in each subspace multiple interactors so, for example, multiple cubes we're using or multiple triangulated uh, spheres. And then we use each of their triangles, um, get the normal of them in these three dimensions, extend this normal to our uh, d-dimensional uh, codomain. And then we could we just add together all hyperplanes we get from all different uh, views and uh, yeah, use these as constraints for our tetrahedra and intersect each tetrahedron with each of these hyperplanes. All right. Um, can you tell us maybe a bit about the uh, runtime complexity of the algorithm right now? So how long does it roughly take to compute the results? Are there any components that are already parallelized or are there uh, things that could be parallelized in the future? Mm, there are things that could be parallelized, but uh, there are, at the moment there are not so many parts parallelized because the, inter um, like the intersection has to be done uh, one hyperplane after one because with one hyperplane we uh, select uh, all tetrahedra which lie inside this hyperplane then we go with this subset and check this against the next hyperplane. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of complexity, um, normal part, uh, some tetrahedra were dropped and some were added to the new list as they are intersected and we get new tetrahedra. So normally we would say we have a complexity of the number of vertices plus the number of edges plus the number of tetrahedra, um, which comes from some sort of preprocessing times the number of the hyperplanes we are uh, intersecting with. But we could also imagine like uh, an upper bound where each tetrahedron is intersected by each hyperplane, which produces an uh, alternating one or three new tetrahedra, which doubles in the end our number of tetrahedra with uh, each time we intersect uh, it with a hyperplane. And so we have an effort which is will be increased by two to the power of the number of the hyperplanes. And in, in talking in times and seconds, um, I could say we've tested it on a normal uh, working station with two uh, Intel processors with 2.4 gigahertz. And let me think, I think eight, pro uh, eight parts each. 32 gigabyte of RAM and an NVIDIA G4 GTX 980. And for our repository, so the first example with a three-dimensional codomain, uh, it took about 
one minute and eight seconds on the average to compute the whole algorithm and reduce the num uh, number of that rate graph from five on about 500,000 to 217,000. And if you're looking on the much com much more complex simulation for the weather simulation about Germany, and if we're looking on the six-dimensional six co-domain, it took about seven minutes and 20 seconds on average to compute, where only five minutes and 50 seconds are used for the uh, intersection of the tetrahedra with the hyperplanes, because we're dealing with 24 hyperplanes in this example, and 4.5 million tetrahedra, which will be reduced to only 40,000 in the end. And also during this reduction, uh, only 28 tetrahedra have to be intersected, um, which we calculated, and the, the other tetrahedra will only be dropped because they lie on the outside of the hyper or hyperplanes. Right. Okay, good, thank you. Um, Hamish had just another uh, remark for the previous question. He said, or you could combine the distance fields from the uh, interactors. I think he, uh, I think it now where the direction will, uh, where he wants to point out, it's the work from uh, the Linshab University of Jochen Jankovai and Ingrid Hotz, where they use the distance field um, or distance free field approach. But the thing is, uh, we at, at the moment we don't use this approach. We only use our interactors to select uh, or to visualize the selected regions of interest and to give the user the possibility to select something and to also have the great abilities of our three-dimensional space like we could rotate the whole space we could uh, uh, look from every angle onto our tetra immersed tetrahedral grid and so i think it's could be done, but uh, it has to be. Uh, we have to think over how to combine multiple of these distance fields together to form a hyper surface, uh, which will be our constraint in our algorithm. And also, the whole intersection is based on this hyperplane uh, in this plane tetrahedron intersection because it's really simple to intersect. Uh, or it's really fast and simple to intersect the tetrahedron and the plane in three-dimensional space. This is what's uh, what we uh, see as a nice advantage of this algorithm. All right. Um, now, Imish adds, which turns it into a recursive problem. I think I have. Uh, we have to uh, think. I think uh, we have to discuss this offline That's as right. there are yes, so many we... uh, ideas and, and questions. Yeah, lots of possibilities. Um, okay, so um, Christian will be available also through Discord um, for even more questions. All right, then let's thank Christian again and then move over to the next presentation, which is taking us back to time-dependent vector fields. The next work is also from the University of Heidelberg with Tony Sacrista, Stefan Jordan, and Philip Sadlo. And we will learn more about the uh, visual analysis of the parameters of the finite time Lyapunov exponent. Hello, my name is Tony Sacrista, and I'm presenting today the paper Visual Analysis of the Finite Time Lyapunov Exponent. Let's start with a little bit of related work. First, we have the seminal work by Haller, where he presented a computation of the FTLE based on the flow map, and also proposed the LCS or Lagrangian coherent structures to be reaches in this field. Related to this, a few years prior, Everly introduced a technique to extract reaches based on the Hessian. The current work makes extensive use of both. Then, Schaden et al. in 2005 showed that the condition for well-behaved LCS is not that the reaches need to affect exactly with the flow but to show a sufficiently low cross flux, which is strongly related to the advection time t. In this context, Sadlo et al. also investigated this relation by setting a lower bound on the advection time. 
Here in this work, we adopt a very different strategy based on a series of context fields. Then we have Sagri's title uh, that extend the concept of FTLE to inertial dynamics and present an interactive exploration framework akin to a visual analysis tool. And as an example of visual analytics in flow visualization, we have Berger et al, who presented an interactive visual analysis of flow simulation data. In contrast, in this work, we focus on the FTLE. In order to motivate this work, we can start by looking at this time-dependent vector field moving around. As we see, it is simple enough, but it hides complex dynamics that are not readily apparent. What we can do is sit some trajectories and see how they evolve, but it, we soon realize that it becomes a mess of lines. What we'll use to analyze this is the finite time Lyapunov exponent, or FTLE, which is a measure of trajectory separation. We compute it like this, where t0 is the seed time, t is the advection time, and then we have the flow map which connects initial positions to final positions after advection. Here we see a ridge in the FTLE in dark blue. This represents LCS. When we see trajectories at each side of it, we see that the trajectories diverge, and that's basically what the FTLE captures. FTLE is a powerful tool, but it has a few problems that stand in the way of its wide adoption. For instance, it's difficult parameterization, especially with respect to D0 and T, as it's difficult to find the right combination of these for your analysis. Additionally, finding the right spatial grid resolution is tricky. You want to choose your detection time high enough so that the features that you need to study show up, but you don't want to go too high, or the LCS may become too sharp and reduce aliasing, so there's a delicate trade-off there. And finally, FCLE is typically difficult to interpret, especially with respect to correctly understanding the separating properties of its ridges. So we set as the main aim of this work to improve the usability and applicability of FTLE in order to achieve a wider adoption. Our approach is structured as follows. First, we'll introduce the concept of aggregation field. Then, we'll show the visual setup of the system. And after that, we'll go over the different aggregation fields that provide context to the FTLE. Our approach is based on what we call aggregation fields. The basic parameter space is spanned by the seeding time t0 and advection time t, and as we see on the right, it is very difficult to choose relevant areas just by looking at the FTLE fields. So, in order to provide context and guide navigation, we introduced aggregation fields, which assign each point in this space a single value. To do so, we use aggregation functions, which take in an entire FTLE field and output a real single value. Aggregation fields look like this on the right. Our visual analysis approach looks like this. Here is the aggregation panel, where we show the different aggregation fields for the current dataset. This is the FTLE panel, which shows and displays the FTLE field for the highlighted position on the aggregation panel. Then we have the timelines, which show sequences of fields for the currently highlighted T0 and T. This is the vector field hypervelocity panel showing the diverging properties of the vector field causing LCS. Then we have the user interface controls, which contains the contextual information pane that displays information on the selected interface element. Then we have the output console, which shows information on the current processings, and the status bar, giving information on the current dataset. We'll see more of this during the rest of the presentation. Let's now start with the aggregation fields that provide context. First, we have the basic aggregation fields. This simply consists of applying different statistical functions on the FTLE values in order to capture the general trends. So we have the maximum aggregation field, which computes the maximum value of each entire FTLE field, and the average aggregation field, which, as the name says, does an average over all the values. Here we have a session with a dataset that contains three vortices appearing at different times, and these show up as LCS. So exploring the maximum, we see two areas in the aggregation panel, black and yellowish, which corresponds to when the first vortex appears. If we switch to the average aggregation, we now see four distinct regions in black, purple, orange and yellow, corresponding to 0, 1, 2 and 3 vortices. So we already see here that the basic aggregation fields are able to capture general trends very well. But we want to provide some more sophisticated context. So let's look at the ridge aggregation. As we said, the gradient coherent structures are topological features which separate regions with different dynamics. They are typically obtained as high ridges in the FTLE and depend strongly on the advection time t. In these two examples we see the difference the advection time makes in the ridge configuration of the same field at the same initial time. Ridges are shown in yellow. 
bridges get longer and sharper as the advection time goes up. So the main aim of bridge aggregation is to obtain quantitative and qualitative bridge measures and provide them as context. So we define three bridge aggregation functions. The first is the total bridge length, which sums the lengths of all the bridges on the field. Then we have the bridge count, which count the number of disconnected bridges. And finally, we have the average gate power of bridge lengths, which sums powers of bridge lengths and averages them using the bridge count, favoring longer and more connected configurations over shorter and disconnected ones. For this reason, we can say that this provides a good measure of the overall bridge importance. In this interactive session with a simulation of the fluid dynamics, we see that the total bridge rank increases with T. We extract the ridges with a low T setting and we see that they are just a few. We do the same with a high T and we see now that they are more and longer in yellow. When we select the average gate power of ridge lengths, we see a band here in the middle advection times, which has higher values than the rest. This points to the region where the ridges are longer and more connected. If we go lower, the advection time is not long enough to produce ridges, and if we go to higher advection times, the ridges may become too sharp and produce aliasing, which brings us to the next aggregation field, aliasing. Aliasing problems are typically caused by a too low resolution of the FTL field compared to the gradients of this field. So, in particular, when T increases, the LCS gets sharper, and the resolution needed to sample them appropriately increases exponentially. In this example here, we have the same field four times with different resolutions, and we see that some bridges which show up at lower resolutions disappear at higher resolutions due to incorrect sampling. Also, we see some bridges in the higher resolutions that are correctly sampled and do not show up in the lower resolution images. So we determine aliasing by analyzing the frequency spectrum of the FTLE. So we will get the frequency spectrum of the FTLE and then integrate around the M% highest frequencies to get a measure of the, their amplitude. Here we see an example with six different resolutions of the same field and we can see that the aliasing goes down as T goes up. Especially the aliasing is receding upwards to higher and higher advection times, indicating that with higher resolutions, longer advection times are applicable. In this last aggregation field, we want to focus on the interpretation of the separating properties of the LCS. We call it region aggregation, and it captures the overall connectedness of the FTLE with respect to its rich configuration. So, starting with the FTLE, we will define a new derived field like this. We start with the FTLE field, we extract its ridges, here we show the original discretization, and then we use it to discretize the ridges. Then we set up a sampling grid for the sole purpose of accelerating the computation. This can go as high as the original discretization. Then, for each node in the original grid, we find the minimum length of the A star path to each of the nodes of the sampling grid, like this one, or this one. If there is no path due to closed regions, we set the length to the perimeter to indicate a high cost. And finally, to get the value at each node, we just sum over all of the path lengths. And this gives us this derived field. We can then apply the basic aggregation functions to this field to get the region aggregation fields. Here we show examples of the maximum region aggregation field and average region aggregation field. The yellow areas in the maximum correspond to configurations with closed regions. In this session, we explore an inertial n-body system with five bodies. First, we explore the average region aggregation field. And then we switch to the maximum, where we see that the yellow areas correspond to configurations with closed regions indicating confined dynamics. Finally, we want to show this uh, last dataset which corresponds to real wind data from the east coast of Africa. We explore first the total ridge length aggregation field. We switch then to the maximum and we can see some structure with a few ridges and valleys in the aggregation panel. Now we switch to the average aggregation field and we see uh, three vertical bands which get more pronounced as we switch to the gate power of ridge length aggregation function or field. These correspond to the night and day cycle as the dataset has a baseline 
of 72 hours, indicating a more fine-scale structure during daytime. Uh, we see that this aggregation function is useful at providing good context for this dataset. So, in conclusion, we have presented a novel approach to the visual analysis of the FTLE. The goal of this work is to make FTLE more usable and better applicable, and we have done that by introducing a set of aggregation fields that support the exploration and analysis by providing context. And finally, we have demonstrated their usefulness with a variety of different datasets. Possible future work could include the extension to 3D and further aggregation fields. Thanks a lot for your attention, and I'll be happy to take your questions. Right, so thank you very much. We have time for questions. So while we are still watching all the clapping hands, um, I maybe have uh, the first one. So you showed us a very nice way of looking at, at the fields through this lens of all these many different aggregation fields, which shows uh, interesting structures and allows you to discover um, patterns. So I was wondering if, if some of the fields that you used appeared more um, descriptive, more promising than others. Do you have any recommendations which one we might need the most in practice? Um, yeah, I think it uh, basically depends on what your problem is. Um, so usually you would uh, start by looking at the basic aggregation, uh, which would give you a general picture of your field, uh, what's happening or whether uh, anything is happening at all. And then you may want to look at aliasing and see if you when maybe too high um, with the advection time or maybe um, you need a higher resolution. Uh, then you can also inspect the reaches to see um, to learn something about the reach configuration. And after that, I would go to the um, region aggregation, which is uh, more descriptive in the sense that uh, it, it tackles the interpretation or the connectedness of the domain. Um, Tino Weinkauf is asking uh, about the computation times. Yes, so um, basically we uh, have uh, most of everything or most of the computation happens in the GPU. Uh, we have two stages. The first one, we compute the flow map and the FTLE. And then the second one, we compute all of the aggregation fields. Um, I have some numbers here, so for example, um, computing the flow map, the FTLE, and the basic and aliasing aggregation. We, we have all of these together in a single number, for example, for a data set with a 200 uh, times 200 aggregation field resolution would be something like 150 seconds. Then if, on top of that, if we add the region, uh, not sorry, the um, reach aggregation, uh, that would go up to uh, about 600 seconds. Uh, that, uh, that is an increase of uh, 300%. And on top of that, if we add the region aggregation, which is uh, very, very costly, um, it go, would could go up uh, basically up to 500,000 seconds. And that is an increase of 81,000%. So here we see that uh, unless you really need it, the region aggregation, since you need to compute lots of A star paths uh, for each of the configurations of your T, zero versus T uh, field, um, usually takes day to, days to compute uh, for very simple data sets. Yeah, 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 I see. All right, thanks. Um, Tino Weinkopf is asking uh, if you tried this on 3D data sets yet. No, we um, purposefully left uh, the extension to 3D uh, for future work because uh, even though it's some aggregators uh, are straightforward to uh, port to 3D, some others may not be that simple and uh, extending it to 3D may even um, open the possibility of new aggregators that we have not mm -hmm. uh, thought of as yet. So um, definitely we will explore this in the future. That's good. Um, so at the moment um, you compute these aggregations over the entire spatial domain, um, which in, in a way loses a little bit the information where um, the events where would it be imaginable to slice the domain down into blocks and then run the computation of your fields per block of those kind of as a matrix? So, um, yeah, that would help, especially in the um, 
aggregation panel because you would have sort of spatial information in, with the aggregation uh, embedded in them. But um, we would uh, need to think how to tackle the um, interactive aspect because um, right now, basically you select the position in the aggregation panel and then that's uh, the affiliate that's shown on the right. But if you have a matrix with uh, lots of aggregation panels, all of them, so basically you have a dimensionality stacking, right? You have uh, exactly, your yeah. space and then you have the T0 versus T space and you have to represent it all in a single panel. So um, mm -hmm. it's it's an interesting idea that uh, would probably be worth exploring, um, but um, it would also probably cause problems. Okay, I see. <laughs> no free lunch, all right. Um, okay, um, so maybe one one last small question. In one of your results, um, where you looked at the total ridge length for the wind flow at the east coast of Africa, we could see a lot of structures, many, many patterns, um, which I found very, very interesting. And I was wondering where are these coming from? Is this maybe something like a day-night cycle? Are you, or is this maybe uh, related to structures are moving out of the domain? Um, do you have an intuition what happened? Yes, yeah, so with this data set, which has, uh, I think it's a three day uh, baseline in, in T0 in time, uh, we see clearly uh, in the rich uh, aggregation uh, the day night cycle. So we oh. see that the, uh, the ridges get more pronounced uh, during the night, actually. And uh, yeah, this um, it, it would have been interesting probably to bring some meteorologists uh, to comment on this and to uh, but uh, to have some um, expert uh, commentary. But uh, we didn't really have time for that. No, oh, but it's really cool that these uh, effects are also showing in the end. That's nice. Yeah, yeah. It, it they show also in the um, average aggregation field, uh, but uh, very mildly. Uh, mm -hmm. When you switch to the rich, uh, rich aggregation, then they show up. Uh, much nicely. Yeah, yeah. Tino has uh, one more question. He asks, will this tool be available? Yes. Um, so right now the code is not published because it's uh, tightly coupled with uh, some other projects. So we need to do some decoupling work uh, and also some documentation and cleaning up um, um, the code. But uh, once that's done, we will definitely publish the code. Yep. All right. Good. All right, then let's thank Tony again. And all other questions uh, can also be asked uh, later in the Discord, and Tony will also be happy to answer those. So then let's move over to the last presentation for the session. This work comes from the Technical University of Kaiserslautern, Arizona State University, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and UC Davis. And the authors are Anna Pialofink, Florian Wetzels, uh, Jonas Lukaszek, Günther Weber, and Christoph Gart. And the title of the paper is Fuzzy Contra Trees Alignment and Joint Layout of Multiple Contra Trees. In the next minutes, I will present Fuzzy Contra Trees, our work on simultaneous visualization of the topology of a scalar field ensemble based on contour trees. Contour trees are the well-understood basis for a plethora of techniques. In ensembles, elementary tasks are comparing members, for example, determine scalar values that induce topological changes in some or all members, combining or grouping members, like finding the common topological denominator, and separating members find outliers, determine which member contains a specific branch. The randomized nature of layout techniques for contour trees and their large parameter spaces result in different representations of identical or very similar fields. Thus, in naive form, contour trees are not applicable to ensemble visualization. Combining the member contour trees results in a chaotic visualization. To avoid this, we require a common layout and thus an identification of nodes between member contour trees. A common choice to find such a matching is the added distance, but it is NP hard to find an optimal matching and the result is a subtree, so features of individual trees might get lost. We use the tree alignment distance instead. 
the calculation is much faster for contour trees and the result is a super tree of all aligned trees. The information of individual trees is thus preserved. Nodes are inserted until the two aligned trees are isomorphic. The result is the alignment. A matching is induced as the nodes in the alignment that are present in both trees. The alignment of two trees is not unique. The minimal alignment is found based on a user-defined metric, which gives our approach a lot of flexibility. We developed a heuristic to align more than two trees. This is done incrementally, one tree at a time, in random order. Starting with the first tree, every leaf is tested as possible root in the alignment. All following trees are also rooted in all their leaves and aligned with the current alignment. The alignment with minimal cost is kept as result. Here is an example with three trees. For each leaf in the first tree, we use it as root for the tree and set the resulting tree as the current alignment. For the second tree, also every leaf is once considered as root. The alignment of first and second tree with the current no root is calculated. The optimal alignment is found for the current root of tree 1 over all roots of tree 2. Then the same procedure starts with tree 3 and the alignment of the first two as input. This algorithm hence exploits the super tree property of the alignment. Aligning an alignment with an additional tree preserves the features of the trees contained in the alignment. This is done for all possible roots of tree 1. The result is the alignment with minimal cost. In this example, the persistence metric was used, which is independent of overlap and location. All other metrics could be used as well. Additionally, cost for a matching between different extrema are extremely high, so it is guaranteed that also in the alignment there are maximal and minimal nodes. While some properties of the alignment render the calculation of a common layout possible, others pose additional challenges to the layout procedure. An alignment would, for example, look like this. So how do we obtain the fuzzy contour tree from this? Finding a layout for the alignment, we find induced layouts for all individual trees via the matching. This layout is calculated similar to a layout for a single contour tree. The alignment has several properties that render simultaneous layouting possible, but also some that pose additional challenges. As a first step, a branch decomposition is calculated recursively. The root is determined by the alignment procedure. Branches with the highest frequency of occurrence in the individual trees are chosen. Based on this decomposition, the orthogonal layout with crossing minimization using simulated annealing is applied. The resulting layout induces layouts to all individual contour trees. These layouts are adapted using information from the individual trees and applied. With matched nodes at identical positions, the individual contour trees can be superimposed to obtain the grouped layout of the fuzzy contour tree. But we can do better, reducing the visual clutter of the edges. Bundling edges for each branch and adding opacity based on the occurrence in the individual trees results in the final fuzzy contour tree. Bundles are shown with a small plateau to avoid ambiguities. At this plateau only the minimal and maximal saddle is shown. In an optional step, the clarity of relations can be improved by optimized vertical spacing. This is done recursively in three steps for each subtree. First, all saddles are stacked on the bottom. Ranges at the parent branch only overlap if they do in the original tree. Then. Spacing is introduced based on the bounding boxes of the branches and finally, the original branch distribution is restored as far as possible. Now the Y value is no longer the ISO value, but properties like distribution and overlapping are preserved if possible. So we reach the final fuzzy contour tree. How can we benefit from it? The tasks we aim to support with fuzzy contour trees are comparing, combining and separating members. To do so, 
we implemented basic interaction. The matrix on top is, represents all members, while on the right individual members are, are shown. We see branch highlighting, tree highlighting of individual trees in the fuzzy contour trees, and member highlighting on the right. Now hands on to a real application. In the heated a cylinder data set, flow around a hot pole is simulated with slight perturbations. Material at rest is heated around the pole, rises and forms a plume. Here is the fuzzy contour tree of all 30 members of this ensemble. First, we compare. At the bottom, only minima exist. Then a layer of maxima occurs followed by a more branched area with mainly maxima. These indicate vortices of different rotational direction. Whether this structure is present in all members can be checked using tree highlighting, resulting in groups. The single blue minimum distinguishes one member from all others. It can be separated using member highlighting. Often overlap measures are used to map features defined by the contour tree. Our approach is more flexible by the user-defined metric. While it is possible to take overlap and location into account, up to now our method is independent of position and area, but based on topological similarity. This works very well for many cases, but requires a sufficient topological similarity of the ensemble members. If this is not fulfilled, there is either no matching found or the result is semantically not meaningful. Also, we work on a super tree, so every member, feature and outlier is visible in contrast to methods that use averaging or other merging techniques for features. This work is intended to provide proof of concept towards the use of tree alignments for layout for multiple control trees. While we are very happy with the results, several points are left for future work. We will investigate the deterministic computation of minimal tree alignments and work on an automated manner to identify non-meaningful alignments. Identifying additional cost metrics for a more general set of tasks and further layout optimizations will reveal further applications in other scenarios, for example in situ visualization. In our work, we combine tree alignments with a novel layout algorithm. We achieve simultaneous depiction of multiple contour trees as a single fuzzy contour tree. With additional basic interaction possibilities, this fuzzy contour tree proved useful in many examples. Thank you for your attention. All right, so very good. We have time for questions. <laughs> and now Svensson is asking the obvious question. Um, first of all, very nice work, and will it be available, for instance, in TTK? Um, we already use TTK for the part um, and for the simplification. Um, it will be available open source, whether it's in TTK or not. We will <laughs> okay, very, very good. That sounds already very promising. Um, you found a very, very cool way of uh, bringing all these uh, contra trees together in one final nice visualization. Um, do you have roughly an estimate for us how long this computation takes in total in, for the individual steps, like the simulated annealing, for instance? Yeah, uh, there's two steps, the alignment and the layouting. Um, for the alignment, we have, uh, what was it? Yeah, then we have uh, one example in the paper, which is of size 64 squared times 128. And uh, the alignment took 1.1 seconds. So that's not too long. <laughs> um, but there also we used uh, the uh, topological simplification in TPK, which is a bit overkill. So we could make it faster, but it worked for our example, so we used it. Um, for the layouting, um, the branch decomposition is the main part um, that takes time. Um, and the simulated annealing that we have a certain border until when it will run. So you can make it as slow as you want. But uh, for our uh, border that we use now and which is proposed in the paper by Heine and all, um, 
it was quite fast, so we didn't even measure it. It was a part of seconds. Um, the one thing on our tool was um, it's on a web page in D3. And um, the main part, which took time, was loading all the images. Actually. So, yeah, we could do that faster, but we didn't optimize that. <laughs> all right, good, good. Um, Vijay uh, Natarian is asking, can you comment on the sensitivity of the layout to the input? For example, how does the inclusion or removal of an ensemble member affect the layout? Um, yeah, since the alignment is uh, not deterministic, uh, we have some variation in, in there, of course. And um, this variation depends already on the similarity of the um, of the individual members. So it depends on which member <laughs> you are skipping. Um, if you skip one that just was not similar to the others, it might get even better the result, or you don't have um, that much differences. Um, and yeah, for the others, we don't have much difference afterwards. I mean, yeah, if you skip enough, yeah, <laughs> you don't have anything okay. to compare, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so, so also when you run the simulated annealing, uh, this has also uh, a little bit of variation to it. So even yeah. if you take out maybe a member that is very similar to one that you already have in there, could you still have some variation? Yeah. The branch decomposition is deterministic, so um, there's not much variation to affect there. Um, for the simulated annealing, it works with the branch decomposition. So um, there, if you have run it long enough and find an optimum, these optima are always very similar. It's just flipped or one branch is on the other side or something like that. Okay. But um, yeah, usually it's very similar if you run it long enough. If you find not the optimum, then yeah, maybe it's sure. Of course. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Sounds good. Um, then Hamish Kaar is asking how many uh, runs in the ensemble before the interface becomes overcluttered. Um, we don't, it wasn't the intention to use this for like thousands and ten thousands of ensemble members or something, but it was, we used it for like 30 now and it looked pretty nice, as you saw. Um, <laughs> Um, of course, there's, yeah, it's not done for the big thing, for, for thousands, and so we didn't try it at all, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I, I, I think there's, I mean, you can probably double it and it will be fine. It also depends on how good they match. I mean, I get uh, one edge for every node that is matched. So if I have a lot of different uh, nodes because they haven't been matched, so then it can be cluttered, of course. But then it's also the question if it's a good idea to compare at least if they are not matched at all. So, yeah. Okay. All right. And Ingrid Hotz is asking, uh, what is the impact of outliers in the ensemble? Um, yeah, there was one example in the video, right? This small blue thing, <laughs> which was only in one member. Um, the matching is was performed very good um, in, in finding these outliers and not matching them to anything else. So, um, yeah, this will just be a single uh, edge in, in the uh, control tree, which is not very okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. All right. Very good. So, any other questions? This is your last chance for the live part. Afterwards, you can still ask your questions uh, over Discord. All right. So if there are no other questions, then let's thank Anna and all the other speakers of the session again. Thank you very much for attending. And uh, we can close the session. Have a nice lunch. <laughs>